As I mentioned this morning, uh, a couple of weeks ago in Houston, we had the debate concerning the mechanical instrument of music. On Monday night, Tom was in the affirmative, therefore he got to basically set the stage as to the way the rest of the week would go. And may I say that Tom did an outstanding job, and I think you knew he was going to do an outstanding job. Tom is a student of the scriptures and a lover of God, and he wants people to know what the Bible teaches. And so whenever he signed the proposition that uh, singing is the only authorized music in Christian worship, he was trying to convey to those listeners and to his opponent the mind of God and the will of God. And that's the purpose of studying some of these things that seem to be uh, no longer needed today. But I think some of us recognize that we need to study these things more than some of the things we are studying, such as how to feel good and how to influence people. We need to study how to worship God instead of simply how to feel good. When we recognize that we are worshiping God exactly the way he said, Brethren, that makes us feel good. If not, why not? Well, as you look at the proposition that singing is the only music that God has authorized in Christian worship, and I try to emphasize in Christian worship. We're not talking about pagan worship. And we recognize God doesn't uh, authorize pagan worship at all. That uh, we're not discussing uh, the worship of the Jews. We're not discussing what you do at home, except that, except that whenever you are at home and you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, that is Christian worship. So whether it's public or it's private, singing is the only music that God has authorized in Christian worship. In Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians chapter 3, we have the authorization given by God. In Ephesians 5, Paul says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. In Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with grace in your hearts unto the Lord. These two passages <clears throat> are saying the same thing. But notice that he has authorized the kind of music. Now, Mr. Ross doesn't like to discuss the kinds of music, and when he does discuss the kinds of music, he will say that there is the wind instrument kind, and there is the uh, string instrument kind. But we have been taught and correctly so, accurately so, that there is vocal music and there is instrumental music. And those are the two kinds. Ross doesn't like that. He doesn't even think that singing is music. And then he makes fun. He makes fun of the Church of Christ motto, speak where the Bible speaks, call Bible things. Brethren, he doesn't even know what that means. He doesn't even know what that means. Listen, you don't call me an elder because I'm not an elder. You don't call me a pastor because I'm not a pastor. That's what that indicates. And we call the church of Christ the church of Christ because that's what it is. And we can't find Baptist church in the scriptures. We can't find Methodist church in the scriptures. That's what that means. And the principle behind it is when God says something, that's what it is. And so Mr. Ross would make fun of singing is music. Nowhere does the Bible say such. Well, it is music. And it's the kind of music that God has authorized. Whenever you read Ephesians and Colossians, you see him say singing. And I mentioned to you this morning that uh, all Ross had to do, he just had to do one thing. All he had to do was give a passage of Scripture 
that would show and authorize mechanical instruments of music. Now, Kevin, what passage did he go to? He didn't go to the Old Testament. He couldn't because that's not Christian worship. He couldn't go to the book of Acts. He couldn't go to the book of Romans because mechanical instruments of music are not authorized therein. There is no passage at all. And so Mr. Ross, for four nights, 20 minutes per session, three sessions each night, never was able to come up with one passage that would have a mechanical instrument of music in it. Not one. Now, that's not a fault of his. That's a fault of the doctrine that he was teaching. There is no God authorization of mechanical instrument of music. Well, surely, Ron, he didn't spend a week just standing up there silent, did he? No. What he did do was try to go to Tom's passage in Ephesians. As I mentioned this morning, one thing he tried to do was to show that Psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, that Psalms was the book of Psalms, and the book of Psalms was always accompanied with mechanical instrument music, therefore Psalms in Ephesians 5 authorizes the mechanical instrument of music. And I mentioned to you this morning the way that Tom counteracted uh, that was to show that in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, that the word Psalms in that passage was not limited, was not discussing the book of Psalms. And that would be so in Colossians, and that would be so in Ephesians. That is not a limitation to the book of Psalms. It is simply a word for general songs that have a spiritual message. Just like spiritual songs, just like, uh, I forgot the other word, hymns, those are general songs of praise to God that have a spiritual message. And so it is with psalms. And so that particular argument fell flat. Well, the second thing that Mr. Ross tried to do was to show that make melody in your King James, American Standard, make music in your New International and a few others, that that is from the Greek word solo, and solo means play an instrument. And whenever you played the instrument, you were to give the heart in playing that instrument and singing. Well, he's incorrect. He's incorrect. The word solo is not limited to playing an instrument. It simply means, as its base meaning, to pluck, to vibrate, to twang. And you must name the instrument that is to be vibrated, that must be played. And Paul names the instrument. What is it? Making melody, solo, in the heart. There's the instrument. Paul gives you the instrument in the text. And so that completely removed his argument. And he had nowhere to go. By the way, another argument that Tom brought up that I mentioned this morning was, who is to do the soloing in the heart? Mr. Ross says one or two people. But Paul says that all were to speak, all were to sing, all were to make melody. Solo. All were to give thanks and all were to submit. Mr. Ross says, no, all are to speak, all are to sing, all are to give thanks, and all are to submit, but one or two can solo, can make melody. Well, Mr. Ross is incorrect in his conclusion. God has given in this passage five commands, and all Christians must submit themselves to it, not simply one or two folks. But now I want you to look closer tonight at the phraseology, making melody in the heart. Now what does that mean? Mr. Ross would quote one of our brethren and misquote and misstate and take him out of context. And he would say, Ephesians 5, 19, in your heart simply means the heart is in it. Now what's wrong with that? Brethren, before you go any further, mark it down. It is absolutely true that when you worship God, your heart must be in it. Let me say it again. When we worship God, when we obey God, our heart must be in it. But is that what 
in the heart means in Ephesians 5.19. Well, let's look closely. Mr. Ross would let us know in one of his charts, as he would look close at Ephesians 5.19, that both the singing and the playing are to be in your heart. And he says, if the playing is silent, then the singing is silent. Well, sounds like he's got us. He concludes and he says, can my opponent explain how the singing is audible and in the heart? Yet the playing is silent. Well, the problem, Mr. Ross, is this, that the singing is separated from making melody in your heart in the text. You do not play singing in the heart. That is not what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying singing in the heart. Paul is not saying singing and playing in the heart. Paul is saying singing and playing in the heart. And there's a difference in those two things. Well, Mr. Ross would let us know that in the heart means to have your heart in it. But I want you to turn to Ephesians 5, uh, Matthew 5, 28, and see what in the heart means. Now, whenever you search out the scriptures and you look for the phrase in the heart, in the original language, it would be in te cardia, in te cardia, that is in the heart, cardiac, cardia, the heart, in the heart, you'll find that phrase 20 times in the New Testament, 20 times in the New Testament. And in every case, it means the same thing. Mr. Ross says it means to have your heart in it. No, it means that what you do, that action is being expressed in the heart. Sounds the same to me, Ron. Well, let's study a little closer and see. In Matthew 5, 28, Jesus said, You've heard that it said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her, watch this, hath committed adultery with her already in his, in his heart. Does it mean to have your heart in it? No, absolutely not. The phrase in the heart, in your heart, means that that is the location that the adultery is taking place and that the action, adultery, is being expressed by and in the heart. Now that's a vital point to keep in mind. And I want you to notice this. And this is a vital point. Mr. Ross said, well, wait a minute. Matthew uh, 15, 8 and following says that adultery comes forth from an evil heart and lying and cheating and stealing. And he's right. That's what Matthew 15 says. But Jesus is not saying the same thing in both passages. It is absolutely true that adultery and stealing and lying comes from the heart. But that's not what Ephesians 5.19 is saying. Nor is it what Matthew 5.28 is saying. Are you with me now? Here we go. Matthew 5.28 Jesus, by the phraseology, adultery in the heart, limits the adultery to the heart, and there is no outward action in that passage. Do you see that? There's no doubt. There is no doubt in Matthew 5, 28, there is no adultery taking place outside of that man's heart. Now, indeed, indeed, later on, it possibly could be, but brethren, it's already sin because he's already committed the act in his heart. And that's what Jesus is teaching in the passage. Let's look at another one, Luke 2, 19. You may remember that Mary came to the temple and there she heard some wonderful things concerning her son. And the Bible says that she pondereth these things in her heart. Brethren, did she ponder those things outside of her heart? You can't. The action had to be expressed by the instrument, the heart, in the heart, and was limited to the heart. 
And every time you read in the heart, in the New Testament, it will always be action that is limited to the heart by the heart. It is never expressed outside. Let me give you yet another passage found in Romans 10, 9. Here's a passage that we quote backwards and forwards. Of course, when I say that, I never can quote it. But in Romans 10, verse 9, Paul said, Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart. Well, what is doing the believing? The mouth? No, the heart. The heart is doing the believing. The believing is taking place in the heart. That's where it's limited in this passage. In this passage. Now, another passage may tell you to believe outside the heart. That's fine. Adultery may be outside the heart. That's fine. Pondering may be outside the heart. That's fine. But the other passage has to tell you that. Of course, I don't know how you can ponder outside the heart, do you? Now, the belief in the heart is what's taking place inside. And the confession is the outward manifestation of what you have in your heart. And he makes it clear in the passage. Now turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 1. We have a lovely elderly lady. This lovely woman, godly woman, wanted to have a son. Her name is Hannah. And she could not because she was barren. And she went to God in prayer and prayed for a son. And so in 1 Samuel 1, 13, the writer says that she spake in her heart. Did you hear it? She spake in her heart. But her voice was not heard. Do you see that in this text that she did not speak outwardly? But there was a speaking in her heart. The action took place where? And by what? The action took place in the heart by the heart. Brethren, you can read in the Old Testament 40 times the phrase in tachardia, in the heart. And in every passage it always means the same thing. The action takes place in the heart by the heart. And for the action to take place outside of the heart, another verse must let you know that it is going to take place. For instance, it's absolutely true that Hannah at times and other women and men as well, godly before God, not only spake in their heart, but they spake aloud. But that's not what's being said in 1 Samuel 1.13. What's being said in 1 Samuel 1.13 is the action is taking place in the heart, by the heart. One last passage found in Psalm 40, verse 10. So now we've got three New Testament passages, examples, out of the 20. That leaves 17 more we could look at, but there's no need to. They all teach the same thing. We now have two Old Testament passages, but we could look at another 38, but there's no need to. All 38 say the same thing. In Psalm 40 and 10 we see, I have not hid thy righteousness, within my heart. Kevin, now what does that mean? I have not hid thy righteousness in my heart. Well, the next verse tells you, I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. Now, if he had hid God's righteousness in his heart, what would have occurred? It would have been right there and not on the outside. So the action, hiding God's righteousness, in the heart would have stayed right there. But he said, I didn't do that. He's putting a negative in there. He's putting a knot in there. I didn't hide it in my heart. Well, what'd you do? I declared it. That's what he's saying. And that's what is meant. Well, Mr. Ross would come along and he would give us a chart. And he says, singing and making melody in your heart simply means the same thing as in other passages where something is done in or with the heart. Well, he's right. But that's not what he thinks he's saying. See, Mr. Ross thinks, <coughs> Ephesians 5, and other passages as well that say in the heart mean that you must have your heart in it. But then Tom showed him the, pa the passages I just showed you 
And Mr. Ross backed off and he said, wait a minute. I didn't say all other passages. I just said other passages. He got caught. He got caught. He means all other passages. But he got caught and so he backs off because he saw what you see. And what you see is Matthew 5, 28, in the heart is limited to the heart. Luke 2, 19, pondering in the heart is limited to the heart. Believe in the heart in Romans 10, 9 is, in that text, limited to the heart. And so it is also in 1 Samuel, and so it is also in Psalm 40, that the action is limited to in the heart and does not mean to have the heart in it. And so he had to back off of his statement but Mr. Ross, really your statement's right. But your conclusion's wrong. It is so. It is true. Sixty Old and New Testament passages that have in te cardia, in the heart, it always means that the action expressed takes place in the heart. In every case. Well, Mr. Ross also had another chart. He says... Please name one act of obedience or worship which is not required to be in the heart. When David said he would praise God with my whole heart, did he use his lips? And did he ever use a mechanical instrument when doing so? Or was it all silent, confined to the inner parts? Boy, well, he's got us, don't he? The passage he's quoting is Psalm 138. Turn to Psalm 138. He's got us. After all, this act of obedience, this act of worship by David was with his whole heart. And that is not silent. That is not simply the inner parts. But it's the source. No, Mr. Ross, me thinks you're wrong. Let's study his passage. When I was going to uh, school under W.S. Boyette and Gary Colley and W.R. Craig, Time and again, they would say, the answer is in the passage. Watch. Now keep in mind Mr. Ross's argument. We're reading now Psalm 138, a psalm of David, the Bible says. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Now remember Mr. Ross's argument? That means that that can't be simply silent praise. That can't simply mean inner parts. Yeah, it does. Now listen to the next phrase. Same passage. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. So you see in the first phrase he says, my heart is the instrument that will praise God. And I'll do it with the whole heart. But the second phrase, I will sing, is the outward manifestation. The first phrase is the inward manifestation. The second phrase is the outward manifestation. Just like Ephesians 5, 19, singing is the outward manifestation. Making melody in the heart is the inward manifestation. Well, he would give us another passage in our same quote found in Psalm 98, verse 5. 98, verse 5. In Psalm 98, it says... Sing unto the Lord with the heart. Oh, he's got us now, doesn't he? See, when you sing, you're to sing with the heart. Always. Oh, wait a minute. The instrument's name. That's our point. Follow with me. Sing, solo, unto the Lord with what? The heart. Now, when you turn over, we're not through that passage. Don't leave it yet. But when you turn over to Ephesians 5, 19, and you solo, make melody with what? The harp? The heart. Do you hear the instrument being named? Watch David now, back to Psalm 98. Watch David now say, not only with the harp, but with the voice of a psalm. Did you hear him? I want you to solo, he said, with the harp. I want you to solo with the voice of a song. And so the solo with the harp is the, an outward manifestation. 
and the solo with the voice is a second outward manifestation, and he named the instrument as he would give us the passage. And we must understand this. Someone has said, God heareth the heart without the mouth. God heareth the heart without the mouth, but never heareth the mouth acceptably without the heart. And so in Ephesians chapter 5, 19, whenever Paul said singing and speaking, he said, you sorrow with the heart. You vibrate the heart. Now I want you to look, as you're looking at that, a passage we brought up this morning, and that's Colossians 3, 16, and see how they blend together. You remember the inspired commentary in Colossians 3, 16? In Ephesians 5, he says, speaking. In Colossians, he tells us specifically, teaching and admonishing. In Ephesians, he says, speaking to yourselves. In Colossians, teaching and admonishing one another. Both passages, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, that's the kind of spiritual songs. And in Ephesians, he says, singing. And in Colossians, he says, singing. That's the outward manifestation. In Ephesians, he says, Make melody, solo the heart, in the heart. And in Colossians, he says, with grace, with gratitude, with thanksgiving. Therefore, you put the passages together, and you hear the Apostle Paul saying that whenever you speak, and whenever this comes forth, this singing of praises to God and teaching and admonishing one another, you must be sure and twang and touch the heart. And when you touch and twang the heart, there will pour forth, not produce. There will pour forth, not produce, gratitude. The gratitude is already there. But when you twang and you touch and you vibrate the heart, this gratitude will pour forth. And where does it come out? It comes out in singing because he commanded singing. Now let's go backwards. The net result is singing, but where did it come from? It came from a heart full of gratitude. Brethren, look at your heart. Look at your heart. When we forget the cleansing from our old sins, 2 Peter 1, we forsake God. When we forget what Christ has done for us, we no longer praise him as he ought to be praised because we've lost our thankfulness. When we forget the blood, when we forget his death, when we forget what he that unspeakable gift, that gift that we cannot express has been given. When we forget that, our worship is no longer acceptable. He will turn a deaf ear. He will not see. He will not hear. He will not take to himself our singing and our praise. Because our, because our praise will be empty and without gratitude. This is why he's given us the opportunity to gather together and to break bread. When I, how did I get to singing to breaking bread? Just this way. When you break bread upon the first day of the week, what goes through your mind? What must go through your mind. When you partake of the unleavened bread, what are you doing? What did God tell us to do? We are to discern the body of Jesus. When you partake of the fruit of the vine, what are you doing? We are discerning the blood of Jesus Christ. That means that I am making a 
judgment, a discernment. I am making a wise decision in my mind. God has done something. God has sacrificed. God has given his blood. God has given his body, physical that is, as he would live in a human body, and die a shameful, embarrassing death that I might live. That's what I'm remembering, and God has given us the memorial, the Lord's Supper, that we might remember that. And when I sing, I also remember that. And I'm trying to teach my brethren in my songs, not only that I'm praising God for what he's done and grateful for what he's done, but I'm teaching my brethren. That's what he's done for them. And when we have a visitor come in and we sing songs of praise, what are we doing? We're teaching them as well. Or trying to. And what a great way to teach. Let me conclude with a little story I heard and saw on TV. You know, so many times we tell our neighbors, if you could just hear some good a cappella singing, vocal music, why you would never want to use an instrument again. Brethren, never use that argument. Don't use that argument. It doesn't matter whether I like vocal music or not. It doesn't matter how my singing sounds to me. It doesn't matter how your singing sounds to me. I may sound like a truck. <laughs> right now, that's about what I sound like, too. You may sound like a wreck looking for a place to happen. Our sound, the beauty of it, is immaterial to God. I'm just like you. I would love to be able to sing like Andy Williams, Perry Como. I would name some rock stars, but I don't know any I like. I would love to sound like them when I sing, but I don't. I don't have to. You see? I don't have to. What God wants to hear is the heart. There was a little lady. This is denominational but it makes a point. And you'll see what I mean by all that. There was a little lady, she told her story. She was born of a mother that loved music. And she, when the child was in her womb, the mother was going to teach that child to be the greatest singer to ever live. But the child was born dead couldn't hear a tone one. Therefore, she would never be a great singer. Now, this woman tells her story of what her mother wanted and how that she would be in her mother's lap and she'd see her mother singing. And she didn't know what it was at two, three, and five years of age. And so she would reach up and she'd hear the vibration. She would hear the vibration. Now, this woman is telling this story among 30 or 40 denominational professional singers, gospel singers, as they are gathered together for a Christmas program, and she's the last one. And she is to sound better than they. And she began singing Silent Night. And she sounded horrible. Follow with me. But out of those 30 and 40 grown men and women, there was not a dry eye in the crowd. Why? Rightly or wrongly, accurately or inaccurately, those people heard her heart. Those people heard her heart. Brethren, as
as beautiful, though it sounded terrible, as beautiful as her heart was to those human ears because she was sincere to them. She loved the Lord to them. There was that gratitude to those people who were listening. That's the way it is with God and a Christian. When you sing, forget you sound terrible, and remember that when you sing with grace in your heart, to God, you sound great. And after all, that's all that matters is how God looks at it, not how I look at it. Or the guy sitting next to me that has to hear me looks at it. Because God is the one that is honored by a thankful and graceful heart. If you're not a Christian, why not tonight? Believe that Jesus is the Christ. Repent of your sins. Confess him as Lord and Savior. And be immersed in water under the remission of your sins. Arise to walk in newness of life. So that when you do sing, there will be that gratitude there. And God will hear you. And God will accept you. Even though you were lost and in sin at one time. Always stand and sing.